Welcome back to The Tasting Room, Season 2, Episode 2. And this is a special episode, and I haven't told you this. Not only is Jared Jordan here, which makes it a special episode, uh, but this is the first one that is going to have video on Spotify. Ah, nice. Previously, we've had, uh, let me get this set up for you. Sure. We've had um, to put the video on YouTube, which we'll still do. Right. Um, but I figured out a way to... Now it's like me and Joe Rogan and a couple other people that have video podcast on Spotify. Congratulations. So, you're yes. famous. How are you, man? I'm good, buddy. I'm good. It's yeah. a little hot today, but it is uh, a little hot. I told you you didn't have to wear the jacket. I know. I'm I'm I was I had a work thing and then I had a car thing and had a wine thing. But here we are. <laughs> a bunch of things. I, I and now I have nothing after this, so that's good. Good. So, so we're gonna drink a few things. Yep. Um before we start, I always butcher people's titles. I would say you are the general manager of the Summit Club. That is actually actually inaccurate See? as of last week. Okay. Um, so I'm I'm a CEO of the summit um, okay. since last year, but so we've kind of been without a general manager uh, since that change happened. But last Thursday, Derek Shanklin, who is my assistant GM, is now the GM of the club. Very so. cool. So you were the CEO doing GM duties yes. for a year. Yes. That's where I got that confused. Yep. Okay. So so for those that are listening or watching and have heard of the Summit Club but don't know what the Summit Club is. How would you define that for someone? Uh, I guess the elevator pitch on that would be we, uh, we're a private dining club and we occupy the top three floors of the Bank of America building in downtown Tulsa, uh, opened in 1967. And basically our core focus and core competency is fine dining, uh, casual dining service and events. And that's basically it. We, uh, we sell food and, and beverage and, yeah. and, and do events and kind of stay in our lane that way. The way so, I explain it too is it's a country club without the pool or golf course. It is. It is. We don't yeah. ever have to worry about the pool breaking down or uh, or rain. <laughs> That's very true. That's very true. Um, so let's start here. I want to go, let's go way back. So okay. getting into the hospitality world, mm -hmm. walk me through your journey of when that started, where it started, and then you don't have to go every job, but just kind of how sure, you got to where sure. you are. It's a, uh, it's a pretty interesting story, actually. I had moved back to Oklahoma. I was in college in Shreveport, Louisiana. And I had moved back here, uh, changing majors and just kind of trying to figure out what my life was going to be like at 19. Um, and I, or 20, and I started working in a restaurant in Muskogee, Oklahoma, uh, called Miss Addie's, um, worked there with another buddy who has worked in this town for a long time. But then I moved up here in 2001, shortly after nine 11, uh, just to kind of, you know, I, I figured Tulsa was better than Muskogee or Tahlequah sure. and got a Probably job. Probably a fair right. assumption. And, uh, yeah. got a job, uh, while I was starting grad school at Northeastern and Broken Arrow. Uh, got a job at the chalkboard in the Ambassador Hotel downtown. Um, coincidentally, my one thing to do after this today is uh, the owners that I worked for for a long time are actually this is their last day owning. Oh no kidding! And, and, I did uh, hear chalkboard changed ownership. They are. Yeah. And we're uh, we're having a gathering of all the old staff today. How uh, much fun so is that going to be? I, maybe too much. Um, <laughs> but tell me tomorrow morning. Right. Yeah. So I was I was working at the chalkboard, and um, then uh, basically what happened. Uh, from there was, uh, became the GM of that restaurant about a year and a half after just kind of working there and, uh, was really kind of enjoying that. My master's degree was focused on derivative securities markets, um, which is that. a fancy way of, uh, saying finance with a specialization in, uh, in options and things like that. Okay. Um, but, uh, you know, about 05, things were not looking real rosy for young guys my age moving to New York and trying to trade hedge funds. And I had a lot of friends who uh, had graduated prior to me that were had been up there, done well, but were moving back because uh, of some of the things going on with the housing market, the economy, mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, and we had opened a second location called the Garlic Rose in Brookside at that point. And um, and as we were continuing to expand, I, uh, I kind of took over the operational side of things and, and, and was overseeing the managers and did that until late 2007. Um, after that, uh, I got into wine brokerage with premium brands out of Oklahoma okay. City, uh, working for Rick Nafee and uh, was a wine rep for the foreseeable future and um, worked, worked doing that uh, while, I was, while I was kind of getting into that. I, uh, you know, I, I was already kind of passionate about wine, I guess you, you could say, uh, but really that was a good excuse for me to start learning a lot more. And I think was the jump off point for something that happened later. And so I worked with premium man really just for about seven years, uh, till about 2014. Um, and then at that point in time, I'd kind of gotten the itch and was no longer burned out of the business mm -hmm. and opened a bar downtown called Mexico. 
um, and which is across. I believe the street. is where we met. Yes, yes, yeah, it was while you were there. And um, so I opened that, and um, a few years later, uh, all of a sudden, I was thirty six, thirty seven, had a one year old. Uh, working till two a.m. wasn't real conducive to what no. I was wanting to do, no. and. Um, and that October uh, of, I guess it was 2016, uh, passed my certified sommelier exam. So congratulations, um, thank you. And um, so around that time, I was starting to look at other things to do, and um, was helping the Summit Club do an executive search for their new general manager. I knew the guy that was doing that, and. Um, was kind of helping him out with that and also looking around for a job. And they'd interviewed a few people uh, and he came back to me and told me they want you to interview and which I was a little taken aback by, but um, interviewed for the position that took a couple months. And then in June of 2017, started working there. Mm -hmm. and, and kind of since then we have, you know, been through three remodels, a pandemic, um, you know, Heat waves, droughts, yeah, ice all storms. sorts of things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, but no, it's been a uh, it's been a heck of a twenty one years here in, yeah. in Tulsa. Um, remind me, if you pass your psalm exam, are you always a psalm? Yes. Okay. So the, there's four levels. Uh, the first level is your introductory level, and that's kind of a two day course that you take, and then you test at the end of it. Uh, the level two is much more serious and focused. It's um, it actually involves uh, blind tasting wines. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a pretty comprehensive theory exam, which theory in in the wine world is just basically the study, the history, and, and the knowledge of all the different things that you can know. Um, and so that's level two. I actually sat, studied for, and then was accepted to take the advanced class. Uh, and then we found out we were having another baby and my oh, wife yes. told me, told me, no, um, <laughs> it's a, the, the advanced is really kind of insanely hard. And then there's the master sommelier, which is, uh, uh, you know, everybody fails at the first time kind sure. of a thing. And it's, it's, um, and there are only a few hundred in the, in I was going to the, say the there's cut. only two in Oklahoma. Yes. Is that right? That I'm aware of. Okay. Um, but, uh, but no, so I, I made it through the certification and worked on the advanced and maybe something I pick up again one of these days, but, um, but I, uh, you know, most of my friends, many of which are your friends as well, would probably say that I have an interesting take on the wine world. And, um, yeah. and as such, I, uh, uh, thought I'd bring a little bit of that today. That's so. a professional segue. <laughs> I like that. That's where I was going next. So where do you want to, where do you want to go first? Well, what you brought? Um, I think we brought certain glasses for one of them. Is that did, the one you we, want first? We, so let's do the cups first. Um, why did we bring red solo cups for this wine? Well, so do you want me to dive into? Yeah, yeah. Okay, take a dive. So I was. I'm going to move this while I you're was, pouring. Okay. I was contemplating what to uh, what to talk about today, and and I was talking to my wife about it while I was cooking dinner the other night, and I had bought her some rosé uh, that she was. Uh, I opened. She poured a glass. Um, it looked a little pale in color in the bottle, um, but as she was drinking it, uh, she looked at me. She goes, "This is a really interesting wine." And I said, "Why is that?" And she, I was, I was like, "It's just a rosé. It should be just, you know, pretty." Yeah, cut most rosés are rosés. Right. And she goes, uh, "No, you should taste it." And I did. At first, I kind of noticed it was the color was off uh, mm -hmm. in the glass, and then I tasted it, and I was like did you mix this with some sherry or something? And she goes, no. And I was like, well, then this wine's matterized or it's yeah. flawed. Something got cooked. For those something. that aren't Psalms, what is matterized? <laughs> so mean? I think the term Madeira. Okay. Um, so Madeira, the way that it is made involves having it on a ship on the ocean in the heat, which causes some oxidation and things like that, sure, sure. Um, which, and we'll get into that in a little bit, but uh, for a still wine, that's not, that's a no, no. Um, and, and it's a very identical thing. It doesn't taste terrible, uh, especially if you like sherry, but, uh, for that particular wine, it was not what, you know, what we were it's looking for. Yeah. And so I was sitting there thinking, um, and I know that you and I have a lot of mutual friends who are farmers and food producers. And, and I got to thinking about Trey Winkle yep. and hasn't um, been on the podcast yet, but he will. Well, I, I, he's probably going to hate this one. Um, <laughs> but so I, I, I got to thinking about, you know, all my friends that work in natural food and mm -hmm. things like that. Just trying to get it right and, for uh, you over here. Oh, there we go. And, um, and that kind of brought up a sore subject with me, which is natural wine. Okay. Um, 
And hot I, take number one. Here we go. So, so are you familiar with natural wine? I am. Okay. So, uh, but for, explain for, for people for the that, audience. Yeah. Yeah. Um, essentially, natural wine is kind of well, it's something that's gone on forever, obviously, but also in the last ten years has really picked up ahead of steam as far as how it's produced. Uh, it's become kind of a fan cultish thing. Um, and the, essentially the idea behind it is that everything from the initial farming all the way through production involves no additives, no manipulation, no anything. So basically it, you know, it is the wine in its rawest form that goes through the, you know, functions of what you would have to do to actually call it wine. Um, I think that we can cuss on this podcast, by the good. way, um, I feel it coming. Yeah. So, I, so, you know. so to me, that's all bullshit. There um, it is. So John's intuition was correct. So right. I'm, I'm, you know, and, and not to say that there's not good natural wine. Mm -hmm. Um, there really are. And, the, and, and the reason I think that the word natural wine or the phrase natural wine is also something that's misinterpreted. So one of the things that you really have to know about natural wine is that it's made, you know, pretty much all over the world. Uh, most wine is made fairly naturally. Um, some people are very diehard about the process to where absolutely um, no pesticides in farming, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. Um no additives, which, you know, there are a few things that happen during winemaking, the use of a controlled uh, strain of yeast or something like that, so that you can have a bit more of a, a balanced fermentation. Um, also, uh, copper sulfate, or uh, sorry, uh, yeah, oxygen sulfate, uh, which, which basically is what they add to wine to help preserve it and also um, just it kind of keeps it clean in the bottle. Okay. Um, this is go they've been using adding sulfur to wine for about a thousand years now. Okay. Um, so millennia. Um, so there, the big de initial debate on on that is is adding sulfur bad and. I think it's not. Um, really, I think that along with any industry, you find advances that happen over time uh, that make something better. Mm -hmm. And that was definitely one of those light bulb moments where, you know, when pasteurization came around and things like that, it was like, oh, wow, we can really, you know, really improve the product. Um, the people that say that sulfur is bad and it's what causes sulfites, all wine has sulfites. Doesn't matter if you put sulfur in the wine or not, um, uh, or sulfides. Uh, the thing about sulfites is that they occur naturally. People say that they cause hangovers. They may or may not. I, I don't know that anyone can actually. The, the hangover may be like this car that the dog's been chasing forever that no one will ever know exactly <laughs> how it happens. Uh, and when the dog catches it, we may all be very disappointed. But um, but the way that – so that, that's kind of the the overview of natural wine. I don't okay. want to get too nerdy into it. Right. But, but that people, was the proper level of but, nerdiness. But yeah. most, most wine these days is biodynamically farmed done, you know, I, I would say 90% of it. Um, you know, they use proper irrigation techniques. Pesticides are really only used in mass market growth. Mm. Um, so you could go to Oregon or say go to Honig in Napa Valley, which their entire process might as well be certifiably organic, except that they add sulfate. So they can't call it organic, but it can be called biodynamic. And then they also can't call it natural according mm. to uh, a certain group of people. Um, and so the big debate that rages on is what is natural wine and is it good or bad? Um, and to say that there are good natural wines, especially in France and Italy, Northern Italy, where they make wine in certain ways, typical to that geographic region. Uh, those wines really are kind of done naturally anyway, but a lot of them are meant to be kind of a vin de paz, which is a table wine in mm. France. Um, so lower alcohol meant to be consumed during the day. And most of these countries have water issues and that's why they do that. So that is a natural process. And, and what it yields is a wine that is, is quaffable, but I wouldn't, you know, call it something that you would just scream out. Oh my God, this is fantastic. Um, but it's a part of their lifestyle in America. It has gone the route of you now have a group of people who are almost militant about natural mm -hmm. wine, and those people are ruining wine. 
Um, they, you know, that's a bold statement. It is, it is. And I'll, I'll get to that in a minute, but, um, there are a lot of really bad natural wines. There are some good ones and we're going to taste one of both today. Uh, but there, there is stuff out there that is absolute garbage and I'm going to encourage you to go ahead and try <laughs> why this some one's of in this a yes. red solo cup. Okay. That's terrible. Yeah, that's not good. It's it's. I've had an Oklahoma wine that's better than that. That tastes like beer, fruit juice without the sugar, like a yeah. flat Welch's. I've had enough of that. Yeah, like um, a flat Welch's grape juice or something. So, for those of you listening, um, that is a wine that is made in the Willamette Valley. I'm not going to call it out by name. I mean, the if you're watching, just, if yeah. you're watching, you can see it. Um, but I hold a special amount of scorn for this wine just because it's so bad. Um, this wine in particular yeah, this, or this, the... this one in particular. Okay, okay. They actually make some of their wines that are good. Because that's what I was going to say. I've had some of their wines that are yeah, a lot better than yeah, that. Yeah. This is just... What is this? It's 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 a rosé of or Pinot Noir to be? and Pinot Gris. Yeah. Technically, I guess you would call that an orange wine. Most orange wine, are you familiar with orange wine? Yes. Is done naturally and it really involves a little mm. bit longer, basically, of the wine sitting on skins and it's usually done with a white. Um, but because of the prolonged exposure to the skins and seeds, the wine turns a bit orange in color. Um, this can also be done with red grapes and you get some really interesting chillable reds that are great. Um, but kind of where this particular wine goes is that this wine is actually, in my opinion, gone through a little bit of Britannomyces. Um, mm. And part of the thing that, and you can maybe taste that on the wine. Yeah, I'm going to try that again. Um, it's got a little bit of that funk that, you know, it does kind of smell like a beer. It, it's You're got right. a breath like a yeah, beer yeah. would, which in beer, you know, some people like that. It almost smells like a sour beer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to, we're coming full circle on that. Um, so there are wines that are now being put on the market that basically someone goes out at the winery and says, I'm going to go make this natural wine and I'm not going to do this. And no matter what happens, during fermentation or whatever, it's going to be great. We're going to put it out. And what they're doing is making a wine that is essentially flawed. If I were to mm. be tasting a wine in a blind tasting for a sommelier exam and having to identify flaws, I would be like, oh, there's bread on that or, oh, that's corked. So these are wines that have inherent flaws uh, that they end up bottling anyway. They market it as natural wine or clean wine and you know it's the it's the next big thing and then people buy it and they also buy the load of shit that they're sold and they're like oh my god this is the greatest thing ever mm -hmm. and you'll remember that you know probably 10 years ago when craft beer was really kind of hitting the zenith of that there were breweries that were you know they'd get a bad batch and it would be funky and weird yeah. and every craft beer and everybody be like, this is the greatest thing I've so ever much had. Funk. And yeah. I'd be like, this is terrible. Yeah. It's not even good beer. So essentially, so let me ask you a question real quick. Sure. So like, we'll say this guy's last name, it rhymes with Mick. If Mr. Mick tastes this, do you think he tastes flaws or do you think this is what he expected or wanted it to taste? So like? I, I think that they recognize that the wine has gone through whatever process it's gone through. Mm -hmm. um, they're aware of that. They've been with the wine since, you know, they, they pressed it through fermentation all the way up to bottling. And a number of things can happen during that journey because um, it's basically an uncontrolled environment, um, you know, using wild yeast and doing things like that. Weird stuff can happen. Uh, they have to make a conscious decision at some point if they are okay with what has happened to it, yeah. be it flawed or just be it really weird. And then at some point they have to go, we're going to bottle this and sell it. Right. That's my, like, if it's not what it's supposed to be, the perfectionist or quality control person in, in me wouldn't release it if my name was on it. Right. So, right. so, and the other interesting thing, especially wineries that use wild yeast is that, a very strange thing can happen once they bottle it. It sometimes can go through a second fermentation True. in the bottle, True. Uh, which can create all kinds of very, very strange tastes, smells, um, colors. Um, so I guess the point that I'm getting at about this is that there are two styles of natural wine, in my opinion. Mm. Um, and this really, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, John Benet, who wrote the book, The New California Wine and The New 
wine rules and is about to have a book coming out called the new French wine. Um, okay. It's basically, and he, he was the wine editor for the San Francisco Chronicle for many years. Really, really informed guy. Um, but his hot take on it is that there are people that are making really great natural wine in a traditional method that's been done for centuries. And then there are people that are basically saying F you to the old way of doing things just for the sake of saying F you, I don't like the way it's always been done. And to me as a wine professional and someone who has tasted hundreds of wines, um, come on, man, the uh, thousands of wines, the, uh, let's be realistic the thing here to me is, you know, it's back to what you said. Is that something that I would want to put my name on? Right. It's an experiment. You know, maybe you taste that at the, with your buddies who are into that. And again, you get back into that whole weird, you know, what yeah. really happens when six craft beer guys are alone without women in the room. <laughs> but here's my thing. thing. <laughs> like on that, if I, if I were to bottle this and something happens in the bottle mm -hmm. and I taste it, then maybe I put on the label instead of, you know, 2020 Williamette Valley red wine, mm -hmm. I put experimental Williamette sure. Valley red wine. And or, and that is not a good sales tool. Am I saying that right? Willamette? <laughs> Willamette. Willamette. That's right. Um, Willamette. So that, you know, when you see, the, it, it was funny when I went and bought this today, <laughs> I walked into my favorite bottle shop and my favorite salesperson was there. And I said, Emily. I was going to guess. How's I, Emily? I said, Emily, yeah, yeah. I said, what is the worst natural wine you've got on the shelf right now. And she goes, I've been trying to get rid of them all. And I said, well, <laughs> that just, sounds like an Emily. She, thing. she goes, I've got some swick. And I was like, fantastic. And whoops. Um, yeah, cats out of the bag. Cats out of the bag. Now. Um, Mick swick. So yep. I went over, grabbed that and said, well, now I've got to get something comparable that, that I think is done well. And, um, she and I had a discussion. She was like, I just can't sell this garbage and like, or people bring it back and they're like, there's something wrong with it. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it, you know, you think about the people who have successfully done weird experiments and I, I had a long thought about, you know, Prairie, uh, today when I was, mm -hmm. when I was driving in. Well, that's what I was thinking of just so yeah, you know, and, when you were talking well, about funky and, beer and, and, and stuff, you know, yeah. there's a different, there were things that Chase did that there were real hit or miss. Uh, there were some great things that came out of his experimentation, but even he has told me there's stuff that never made it because he was like, this is just too, you know, too flawed. Um, he did what Swick did not. Well, and didn't and release it anyway. I think yeah. this particular wine, they did what a lot of other breweries who were trying to say, we're going to do what they're doing. You, you can't mimic something that's that naturally occurring. It's right. really hard to do. And for me, you know, as a wine buyer and as a wine seller, especially if I'm on the floor trying to pair something with food for a, a member of the club or a customer, what have you, the last thing I'm going to do is be like, oh, let me let you try this really weird thing. Do you carry natural wine at Summit? I do. I do. Which uh, ones do you carry? Do you uh, remember? I carry the one we're about to have. Do you carry any by uh, Swick? Uh, no, I don't. Okay. Um, uh, but this Union Sacra, and we can go ahead and try yeah, this. Yeah, for sure. Um, this is a natural wine. Cheers, buddy. Salute. Uh, this is an orange wine, mm. and this is a Gewurztraminer. So which, oh, that when nose you, is you, so when, much better. When you think Gewurztraminer, what do you typically think? Sweet. My mind goes sweet. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. this is this winery is actually uh, it's an Arroyo Seco, and the guy who owns its best friend is from France, uh, and they collaborated on a wine using an old French wine method that is natural with California grapes. That's really fucking good. And man. then you taste it, and it's better than most rosé. I mean it's That's it's really really it's good. It's almost got some tannin. Um it has some really firm acidity. And so when I you know, I came in hot and I was like natural wine is bullshit. <laughs> most natural wines bullshit. There's a lot of bad natural yeah. wine out there. Uh this this is an example, you know, where it, instead of the 25-year-old saying screw you Gen Xers, you don't know what you're doing. This is an example of of a millennial you know, saying, I'm going to try something that used to happen, probably experimented with this several times until mm -hmm. they got it right. And as you can see, pick that up. There's sediment in the bottle. It's unfiltered. Um, yeah, it really is. You yeah. know, just uh, floating around. I don't know if the light can catch it right on the camera, but but, yeah. but for an unfiltered, unfined wine that, you know, is made in a natural state, this is stunning. It's um, really, really good. And about good. 20 bucks a bottle. So I was going to ask, is it on shelves here? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I bought that at Ranch as well. Um, 
So and just for a shout out, Emily Stewart Ranch Acres. owns Ranch Acres, yeah, so, which is the best bottle shop in town. It, it is, and her, her for multiple boy, reasons. Her boyfriend Robert Karnowski also makes great empanadas at Moss the Ed, best so, empanadas in town. So, cheers to them, but but yeah, so that is you can see kind of the diametrically opposed. You know, when they're, they're juxtaposed these wines together, one is absolute shit, and the other one's absolutely fantastic. I mean, what do you want to drink? What do you want to drink by the pool? Yeah, right. They couldn't be <laughs> yeah. more different. They really couldn't. Let me ask you this. To the 25-year-old that's saying fuck you to the establishment and wanting to do things different, mm -hmm. where, what I hear is that wine might be an industry or a world in which you can screw with a couple things and you can invent a thing here or there, but by and large, the process is the process because it's been proven over time. Or well, am I wrong? Do you well, think that there are advancements I, that I, can be made? Yeah. Let's let's wind back a little bit, and I've uh, an interesting history. I, I think that all good innovations or all good innovators, because I don't think that it's that it's improbable to come up with something that's new and innovative. I mean, you know, right now what they're doing, you know, we've had so many wildfires in California and Oregon, right. but and it's tragic what's happened. But the other great thing is, and you have to realize, is most of the vineyards don't burn down; the houses do. There's so much irrigation going mm -hmm. on that it'll dead stop at the wine. It'll burn their mansion down. But because of this, you know, UC Berkeley and, and you know, all the agricultural schools out there that teach winemaking, um, they have gotten so much data in the last five years about how to deal with smoke taint. Can it be taken out? Are there ways to protect against it? You know, things like that. And to me, if you're going to be innovative, you also have to be a student of history. Mm. Um, just saying I'm going to disregard everything for the sake of disregarding it and do it my own way. Uh, I mean, it's disrespectful to the people that came before you. And this isn't my get off my lawn speech or anything like that. Okay, Clint. But, <laughs> but, uh, but to me, you know, all of the great innovations are a little bit of a throwback to a different idea that maybe wasn't fulfilled in its time. Mm. Um and so I do think that there's interesting work being done uh, in advancements, but you know it's also you can also just throw something at the wall and go that's what I'm going to call that wine and it's not right. it's not wine. It, back to what I was saying about you know adding adding uh, sulfide to it, it's you, you know they've been doing it for a thousand years. So literally, you know, let's think the dawn of time around the year one thousand. Mm -hmm. You know that's when it started. So who are we really to say that? That's an unnatural thing, yeah. Um, you know, and not to mention when I go buy a bottle of you know Cab Franc or something that I enjoy by a maker, knowing that they use that, I feel great about it because I know that it's not going to be vintage to vintage consistently tasting the same, like say you know a Bourbon Will or something like that, because they've got a mash bill and they've got a way of doing things. For wine, it's about the expression of the terroir mm. and. That all still comes through despite, I mean, there's an argument whether or not adding anything to it interrupts that process. But I, you know, it, I can tell you if a Cabernet is from Argentina because it tastes like it's got bell pepper in it. And regardless of whether sulfite's added to it or not, um, that that's just indicative of the geography there. And so there, there are certain things that obviously are indicative of the terroir or wherever it came from. And I don't think that some of these things hinder it. I think that you find some interesting things that come about in the process of making wine and they're doing it on such a micro level. Yeah. It's, it's almost like you're fucking with it too much. Is you it know? bad? Is it bad that I don't really care if there's sulfide in it? I just want the wine to taste no, good. No, the, the vast majority of people yeah. feel that way. I want my um, wine to taste good. I want it to taste like what I somewhat in the ballpark expect it to taste like, yeah. depending well, on what it is that I say bought. Say you're cooking a, a big ribeye with blue cheese on it or something like that. You know, you're going to want a big red. Mm -hmm. Um, and cautionary tale, you know, in the, in the late nineties, early two thousands, this process, I love came the soapbox for you and wine here. Well, I, I don't talk about it a lot. I know. I love this. I'm the anti Psalm Psalm. Um, <laughs> in the late nineties, early two thousands, you know, which is kind of the height of Robert Parker and the rating systems and all that stuff, which people, if you're out there listening, ratings don't mean anything. Um, the, they're bought. Well, and a lot of those wines, you know, the the drive for Napa back then was like, if it's a red, it's huge, it's a fruit bomb, it's heavy, it's tannic. And they were doing this process called hyperoxygenization mm. that was actually maturing the wine faster to make it more drinkable and bigger and things like that. 
And I'm like, man, that's a no, no. You're, you're altering the finished product to make it review ready, which Mm -hmm. I think that's cheating. That's like steroids. Um, PEDs, you know? Yeah. So, you know, that, to give you a baseball analogy, that's, you know, that's a no, no, you know, you should have all your titles stripped and all that stuff. Um, so I think that unnatural alterations are bad. I don't think that, you know, using egg white to filter out wine or something. I mean, what's unnatural about egg white? I mean, I had someone the other night ask me, is it vegan? The bottle of wine they ordered. And I was like, I have no idea if they, you know, used egg white to filter out the wine. I didn't know that was a thing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, so there, there, I mean, there are a lot of natural ways to do thing and you know, the sulfites naturally occurring in the wine regardless. Um, so I, I think that, you know, there are some things that have been good advances, but, and back to like John Bonet, the new California wine, you're seeing this real return, you know, the, the age of like the big gigantic red, the, you know, Jordan cab that mm-hmm. was like huge, huge wine. Those days are over. The guys that are running vineyards and running wineries and, and making wine right now are quite frankly, going to more a European style terroir based, a little bit lower alcohol expression of that. And a lot of these guys also think that natural wine is crap Mm. because they can't call their wine natural because it's been turned into kind of a marketing scheme. And then that's where I really hate it. You even have, you know, these mid-level marketing scams that, you know, uh, people on Instagram or Facebook who don't have a real day job, you know, it's like essential oils, uh, (laughs) except with wine, they have these organizations and I won't name any of them that they send, you know, people out to sell wine and it's marketed as clean or natural, uh, won't give you a hangover and all that. And that's BS. They're just selling wine that like they stick a label on, you know, I mean, Mm. it might be natural, but so it's really a double-edged sword. I think that if you have the good intention to go in and do good things, to the juice, Mm -hmm. you know, an experiment, but also, I mean, you have to remember, and this is kind of like the old craft cocktail bartender thing. You know, you can sit there and think that what you made is just fantastic, but does everybody really want to drink a Fernet flip? Right. (laughs) You know, I mean, sure. I'm into that, but you know, it's also a commodity. It's a farm product. Mm -hmm. It's an agriculture product. And you know, it's not like you're going to eat a banana that's turned black, you know, it may be right. natural, maybe as sweet as it's going to get, right. are you going to eat it? No. no. Um, so that's, you know, I, I kind of worry a little bit when I say they're ruining wine, it's kind of like, you know, when craft beer got too ever hyped and, and, you know, the bourbon market now too, yeah. I mean, there's just people Which that, we'll try here in a little bit, that they've that. hopped onto something and, and nothing's bad. Everything's great. And, you know, you have to be able to recognize that even with your favorite wines, when you're tasting them, there's going to be bad years. I mean, you know, Lafitte doesn't get what would be considered a hundred point rating every year because they have bad growing seasons. I mean, yeah. there's a champagne shortage right now. We're not going to see a vintage year in champagne for some time to come probably. Mm. And, you know, along with that, you look at global warming and what it's doing to, you know, moving the wine parallel, which is basically the same parallel that runs, you know, through Oregon and France across across the globe is moving north. Mm. Uh, Canada will be wine country one of these days. No kidding. Yeah. I mean, and and so will the UK. Um, You know, they actually make some really great wines, really good sparkling wine in in the United Mm. Kingdom now. And um, and you're going to continue to see that move a little further north and find new expressions and new terroirs and things like that. So. So yeah, that's my that's my hot take on natural wine. Yeah, um, that was a good deep dive. There's into, there's there's good the wine natural world. wine and bad natural yeah. wine, and and if someone just tells you they're obsessed with natural wine, uh, th- that's fine. But you that's know, a good place to leave but, the but wine there, talk. There's, yeah, there's, that's there's fine. also just some great wines on the shelf out there, absolutely, including, including this. Yeah, one, this so. is really good. Cheers, cheers, buddy. Yep. Uh, let's talk a little business. So I want to go back to. Not necessarily to your Mexico days, but I want to ask what is the biggest takeaway. Uh, you left with Mexico or you left with you from Mexico. What, what did you take away? What was the biggest takeaway? The restaurant business is the hardest thing in the world to do. Mm. Um, and you know, I, I have, I have attorney friends and, you know, banker friends who they're like, Hey, I want to open a restaurant. Tell me what you know. And I usually want to tell them, Hey, why don't you give me 20 grand cash and I'm going to kick you in the nuts. And then I'm going to 
save you 80 grand yeah. on this investment. And they're like, what? And I'm like, I'm, yeah, just don't do it. Like if you, if this isn't in your blood and you really are not a sadomasochist who has a good spouse who can, Sarah, I love you and the kids. Um, <laughs> we'll talk family. At yeah. The end. Who has, yeah. It, you know, it, it's, it truly has to be a passion what we do. And, you know, you can lose that. I did for a while. I stayed in the industry by going into the wine world, but you know, my one takeaway is that if you're going to do this, you have to go full in and, mm. and do it all the way. Um, you know, I, as a going concern, was that restaurant's bar successful? Yes, on many levels and no on many levels. The first one being overtly financially successful. I mean, it's, you know, not writing checks, mm -hmm. you know, for it these days. But, uh, but at the same point in time, it never, you know, and location's a key of that. Other things are a key of that. But my experience coming out of it, my one big takeaway is that, I worked in the business at a really pivotal time, uh, and this would have been for everybody listening, 2013 to 2017, where craft cocktail was really becoming a huge thing. Um, and, you know, there were just the old ways of doing things were coming back, but getting a modern twist. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you look at some of the places that have done really well with it here locally, like Valkyrie, Hodges Bend, um, Saturn Room, you know, these places have basically stuck to the original way to make cocktails. The methodology yep. stays the same, uh, but there's a personal flair on it. And I think that you can correlate that to the natural wine discussion, you know, stay in the lanes and, and, ex, you know, experiment around, but you know, anything it's kind of like with food, when you start having like, you know, foams on food and, you know, it, you know, you're eating, you know, I mean, I, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I want to eat my dinner. I don't want to look at it and smell it. And you do that anyway. But, you know, when they're, when like something's advertised, oh, it's got the essence of this or that. It, it's like, you know, why didn't you just season it? So, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, so it, sometimes if it's not broken, don't fix it. But yeah, my, yeah. my main takeaway is that I worked at a really advantageous time in this industry with a whole lot of great people. I yeah. mean, just most of my crew over there have gone on to really, really great careers at other places. That is true. And, and I would not trade that time in for the world because it really taught me how to be a better business person because when you're not writing yourself checks just to make sure that your employees can and things like that, it really teaches you a whole lot about cost and, and yeah. um, that this is that this is a dogfight every day. But uh, yeah, I mean, but man, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, that was. That was, we had some nights. We did. We had some we nights did. at Mexico. So now at Summit Club, mm -hmm. how big was that renovation? It cost just north of six and a half million dollars. What did you learn from that process? Actually, well, so a little history on that. We, after my first couple of years there, we had really gotten the culinary program on track and, and things were going really well. And the powers that be at the club were like, hey, I think it's time to remodel. And I, I, I agreed. Um, so we decided that we were going to do all three floors in a year. Um, which is about 30,000 square feet of dining and kitchen space. Um, that was in the fall of 2019. We broke ground in January of 2020. And, and then in, a little thing happened in March. And then in March yeah. 17th, I remember I was sitting at McNelly's having a Guinness and some soup because it was St. Patrick's Day. Um, I ran into Elliot Nelson. He goes, everybody's got to shut down tomorrow. St. Patrick's Day is canceled all the restaurants are closing down and we, you know, COVID was still very uncertain at that point in time. So we closed mm. for two months. And about. you guys didn't do anything. Uh, we had to, sh I mean, we take out in a 30 story building is kind of difficult when do. no one's yeah. working. Um, very true. So we, uh, we did what we, the only thing I knew to do, make hay while the sun shines. We didn't have to do construction at night, which saved a lot of money. I started trying to identify cost savings in the whole thing. And, 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 you know, ran a skeleton construction crew up there, but we, we finished phase one, which was two floors by that summer, mm -hmm. uh, after we had reopened and, uh, with that had come our new casual concept, which could have found a better time. People were still reticent to get out. Um, it was hot, but people were getting out mm -hmm. and it was the first time people could wear shorts to the club or order a pizza at the club. And Bill's menu is just spectacular. You remember. Yep. He's uh, done a great job. Uh, and that was really reassuring. Uh, and then, you know, we start getting into latter 2020. Things start getting weird again. You know, they're talking about bringing back some restrictions. 
And we figured we were going to need the space because of all the distancing. So we postponed phase two, which is our penthouse floor until 2021. But I got to thinking, I was like, this, going back to my college days, I was like, this is going to whack the economy out. Like bad stuff's going to happen next year. So we bought every bit of material for the second phase of the remodel and put it in storage. Smart man. Which saved half a million dollars. Did it really? It did. Um, so well that, done. that project started in 21. Uh, we had it open by the end of July of last year. Um, and, uh, yeah, I couldn't be happier with it. I mean, it's, you know, you've seen it. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, I, it's really I, cool. You know, staffing, and I'm sure that everybody that you talk to on this podcast probably could tell you all the horror stories of what we're dealing with. I mean, in Oklahoma, you know, the medical marijuana industry, God love them. Um, you know, it's easier for someone to go work a shift and make the same amount of money working at a dispensary that you could working at night on the floor mm -hmm. and you get weekends off. You know, it's kind of so I do I blame any of the service. Is industry? that the biggest theft of uh, that and just the general behavior of people during the pandemic? Mm. Um, there was a lot of burnout, a lot of mental health challenges, which we're, you know, ourselves trying to figure out how to improve that in our world um, as it goes. But I think a lot of people just got fed up with being yelled at and, you know, I get that. Uh, and just said, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, and I, I wasn't one of those people. We were going through something of a new thing. So mm -hmm. it was, it was all new frontier for us. Um, and I've, you know, my team stuck with me. Uh, in fact, we've added 40 employees since the remodel. So it's been a, it's been a huge growth for us. Um, but I think that a lot of people just got tired and it's, it's really, to me, that's the biggest tragedy, uh, in our industry of what happened was that we lost all these great people to mm -hmm. go do other things. And, and I hope that they're all, all well and doing them now, but the labor pool since then has been made up of mercenaries and people going from new restaurant to new restaurant, just making quick cash. And then, you know, not to get into generational politics, but I don't have a lot of faith in Gen Z as mm -hmm. restaurant employees. Um, I, I had a really interesting interview with a young man who applied for a bartending position that told me that he taught himself during the pandemic how to bartend, but he was the best bartender in town. Uh, but he also didn't work Thursday, Friday, or Saturday nights. And so I... <laughs> informed him gently that the interview was over and he asked me what the problem was. And I was like, well, those are the nights you work. Yeah. And, uh, he said, well, I wouldn't have to. And I said, you know, that's fine. Um, there, there are those of us that came up in my time, you know, <laughs> how do you expect to make money? I don't know that money matters fair, um, to some of those people. I mean, when I was a server and, you know, and a bartender, it was all about money. I mean, that's Absolutely. why we did that's it. That's why you had the job. <laughs> you know I, mean? right? I had to work four cash days a week, and, all cash, yeah. didn't have yeah. to report everything. Me too. You know what? There was a lot of alcohol. Um, you know, and we lived in, in kind of the last great era. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, the millennials really helped this propel this industry forward in a great way. Mm -hmm. Um, and then when we got to the end of kind of all of them growing up, essentially, and becoming management or you know yeah. innovators, you know this next generation of kids, it's um, it's a little upsetting. I mean, they don't, I don't think they understand hospitality because I think that they've you know parents have served on them hand and foot, and you know going out to a restaurant is just going out to a restaurant to them. When I was a kid, uh, and my dad was a member of the Summit Club, you know going there was a big big That's deal. Special event, um, yeah. You know now, I know servers. Uh, in the industry that, you know, they don't probably make great money, but first thing they do is go drop it on a $250 dinner at a nice restaurant, you know, which again, not to tell people to get off my yard, but you know, I was also pretty financially secure when I was a part, like we made money, you yeah. know? Um, so I don't know that money matters. And, and just like we had to get to know the millennials and, and they were easy to figure out cause they were up front, very upfront about what they wanted. Mm. Um, I think that they're going to have to learn this next generation and I wish them well. So, yeah. um, it's, you know, hiring has been tough. Um, I think that's the biggest challenge coming out is, you know, we have people cause we're business is booming for restaurants right now, but you see places closing early, you see, you know, smaller menus, you just don't have the staff to support mm. what a fully functional operation would be. And I don't think that, that the general public really understands that. 
They um, will start to when they continue seeing restaurants close. That I mean, and menu pricing being what it is yeah. with inflation right now is, yeah. is a very difficult thing. I mean, luckily, we haven't seen a ton of it in the spirits side of things. Right, just food. Um, yeah. Really on food. Um, but it's coming. I mean, it, it is. And I think most of this is permanent. Um, and, and not to be a naysayer or Debbie Downer because I'm not. Uh, but I also think that this is something of a market correction for our, our industry because you think about the 2000s, which brought on the prevalence of chains and all the independent mom and pop places who were doing good work were having to price compete with Applebee's and Chili's. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that because of that, food costs has continued to go up and margins have continued to go down. And, and I think that this is kind of a... a a great correction in the market. You know, people are like, why yeah. is a filet $70? Well, it's because what it should be. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, if I want to run a 30% food cost, it probably needs to be 80. Right. Um, so I think that there's some education to the general public that we're still dealing with um, that, that, you know, and, but I'm, I'm really positive for the industry though, moving forward. I think that what you're going to see is that the people that don't do it right, don't end up finishing or mm. doing well. But the people that really have done this, and I've got a lot of friends who I, I watch suffer through COVID and all that good stuff, but they've actually come out doing better. I think it's made people stronger and, and, you know, we fought for it. Um, you know, especially in this city, uh, Elliot, who owns McNally's, I mean, he basically took on educating the entire restaurant community about the regulations, how to get mm -hmm. money, this, that, and the other. I mean, when he called me and my, my business is a, as a nonprofit. So we weren't eligible for a lot of things, but you know, what could I do? Call and lobby, call and, you know, I mean, I called congressmen every day and just was like, Hey, what are you going to do for these people? Cause the employees were sitting at home, not making any money cause we couldn't work. So, mm -hmm. um, so I think that while well, you have had that shrinkage of, of the employee base, the people that will come out of this will be really, really good at what they do. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, we are already starting to see, staff members taking interest in being educated. I've put a real premium on, Hey, if you want to learn how to do something, let the company pay for it. We'd love to, you know, cause it, during my prime, I guess, uh, you know, there were what six or seven of us that were sommeliers running around, you know, and, and I want to see that again. I mean, the education's sure. a big part of it. Um, there's almost an arrested development in the industry right now that I think we're going to have to kind of, Go through some therapy therapy together to get past, yeah. but uh, but yeah, it's I but I'm I'm extremely optimistic because I think that you are seeing some innovation, um, in food and in in really you're seeing some great stuff in the wine world and spirit world uh, that are just fantastic. So I'm I'm very optimistic about the future. Uh, I always try to be because uh, yeah. you know the day that I'm not, I'm no longer having fun, which means I got to get out of this business. Yeah. So. So, yeah. As I ask you the next question, I'm going to pour some of this uh, bourbon. Sure. And it, the question is, where do you see Summit Club's next venture as far as what's next? But the framework for that and kind of a sub question is with a lot of places, it can be expansion, whether it's opening up another location or building on to wherever they are. You're like we've talked about kind of confined to three floors at the top of a building. So when you think of what's the next iteration of summit club or, or where does it go? So we, we actually, how do you we are do the, that? Right? We are in the process right now of a couple of things. Cause you, you know me very well. I have a hard time sitting still, you know, everybody has kind of, yeah. And I've, I've got an awesome crew. They're fantastic people. And a lot of them have been like, Hey, you know, we did it. I, and I hate saying that because I'm never really done. You know, I mean, mission accomplished is not a, uh, a thing I ever like to say, because, you know, I think the mission for me is 15, 20 years from now, and I'm old enough to not be doing this anymore, is to say, man, that was a great body of work. That's mm -hmm. mission accomplished for me. And did I raise some great people in the industry? And did I teach people how to be better? Did I pass on lessons that I learned? Because I'll be real honest. I was talking about this the other day. When I was the manager of the chalkboard, I was such an asshole, such a little shit. It's um, funny how you know, Ben Alexander cocky. said the same thing. No, I mean, and it's, like, you're it's, 23 years it's old. It's an evolution, you, right? I, yeah. I just had a conversation with a, a really bright young man the other day who's a chef for us. And he'd kind of been getting into it with the front of the house. And, you know, 23-year-old me would have just let him have it. And he probably would have been, you know, not really happy about that. 
but I brought him in the office and I was just kind of like, you know, harmony between the front and the back is good. And, and I used to yell at people and do things like that. And it's not, it's not conducive to, you know, moving forward. And kind of the rule at the club is that Bill and I are the only people that are allowed to yell at each other. Uh, <laughs> and that's only because, you know, he turns into Whitney Houston when he's, when he's hungry. Um, <laughs> but no, so we've, you know, I, I think that for us, we're actually investigating how we expand or move on. Um, and I think that that happens in a couple ways because the club business particularly, John, has gone through this huge boom since COVID because becoming a member of a private club is a something that's fairly new to older millennials because they have the the income, expendable income, and a lot of them don't have children, which mm -hmm. is great for us. Right. Um, they like a tailored experience um, and, you know, being able to be a little bit, uh, I don't want to say elitist, uh, but have kind of an elevated, you know, the, a, a curated um, experience. And I think that's something that's always been part of the millennial mindset. And we've seen it in city clubs. They're seeing it in golf clubs. Yep. Um, the club business is going crazy right now. Um, I mean, our, our growth since the pandemic is almost 100%. Um, and that's nuts. That's incredible. Um, Good job. But we've, uh, you know, the things that we've looked at is expanding, A, within the building, you know, we just concentrate on food and wine, but we've talked about getting into the possibility of hospitality rooms, like hotel rooms for okay. our members, which you see in a lot of bigger city clubs, uh, athletic facility, something like that. Yep. Um, and I think that those are things that we could potentially add on for the experience there. But we are also taking a very, very uh, initial look at another market right now. Um and that gets really tricky, uh, especially here in Oklahoma. But, um, but yeah, we are looking at the possibility of another market because I think that if you figure out how to do something that people really enjoy quite mm -hmm. quite well and you can reproduce it, that's really kind of the goal. If you can, you know, creating the team that gets the job done, that's the exciting thing for me. Yeah. I mean, we can sell awesome bottles of wine and fantastic food all day, but it, to me – it always comes down to the human experience and mm. not it's that between us and our members, between me and my employees, uh, you know, it, it's to me, it's about humanity. Yeah. And that's, that's what really gets me out of bed every morning to keep doing this. So it's, uh, I, and I, you know, it, it's the hardest, but also one of the most rewarding, uh, things to do in the world. So good answer. So what we're sipping on here, okay. let's talk you, about that yeah, for a second. Yeah, this came in. I'm a member of a it's couple. Rye. It is. Your, your nose <laughs> is, is good, sir. Uh, so this is a peerless Kentucky straight rye whiskey single barrel selection from one of the uh, two bourbon groups that I'm in. This one is a one for, I don't know if you've ever seen them on YouTube. They're called the Bourbon Junkies. I have. I, so enjoy, their, I enjoy their show. They are very good. Yeah. So I pay their Patreon to get some of their barrel picks. The reason I did it was to get the Stag Junior pick. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I'm going to get it. It was a short barrel, the one that they picked. So, But I've gotten some good bottles you know, because of that. And I actually had this Peerless for the first time. Not this one, but Peerless at Sidecar here yeah. in town. And then I saw them come up with this pick. And so I jumped on it. So it's not the cheapest rye whiskey in the world, but it definitely you can smell. Do you mind what I ask it as a bottle? Yeah. So this one ran me in the 90s. Okay. And then it was plus shipping. So it was you know right over 100. Um, so it was, it was a little more than I normally spend on a bottle of bourbon. I like to keep it somewhere in the 50 to 70 yeah. range, you know. But because I had had it at Sidecar and the one I had at Sidecar, I don't know if it was just the day or whatever. But when I had it, I was like, that's the best rye whiskey I've had. And so this one, I don't know if it's actually, I actually haven't tried it yet, so I can't say anything about it yet. Hold on. That's fucking outstanding. Yeah, that is really, really good. They um, do a really good job. I haven't had their bourbon. I've just had their rye. You know, there's not, this is a really good example of rye, like in what it should be. It, mm -hmm. It's got heat. It's got spice. 110.8 proof. Yep. Um, man, that's good. Yeah. Like, no, like, and I, I'm. I don't shoot rye anymore. I try not to shoot things, period. Um, but back in my bartending days, it was always a high life and a shot of rye whiskey mm. at the end of the night. And that's kind of how I, I wound it down. Usually, we would have so much espresso during the course of a shift that <laughs> you, were you had to have something <laughs> yeah. for the Uber ride home. Yeah. Um, but that's fantastic. It was really good. Yeah. I'm glad you like it. So let's talk a little bit about family and then I'll let you go. Okay. Um, how does... I, I asked this... Uh, 
it's amazing to me. Like I just have to tip my cap to the wives out there. Like you talked about mm-hmm. of people in this industry that are, I mean, I know you try to be home as much as you can. Uh, I get the biggest kick out of your Instagram stories, Margo doing Margo things. Um, but how do you balance just, uh, that's what I ask everyone, you know, how do you do that balance of, so, especially for someone, you know, I asked this to Ben Alexander last week and you know, he's in charge of 20 something kitchens. So uh, for him, I was like, dude, how in the world do you balance that for you? It's like, do you have to, can you, or slash, do you have to switch off the mindset of work to go home? Do you try to leave it at the office? Do you always bring it with you? What's that balance like for you? So I haven't heard what Ben said yet. And, and I know Ben well and his family. I mean, if anybody can, and I, I want to give that guy total kudos because his experience has been yeah, we talked much through all of than that. mine. Yeah. Um, Natalie's a and, saint. Well, and she's been a friend of mine forever and they're great people. And those kids are just adorable and mm-hmm. fantastic children. Um, Little you know, ninjas. For me, it's been, it's been a learning process. I, I got married late, uh, although I went, met my wife in a restaurant um, or a bar, uh, had kids late. And so I had gotten out a lot of the career stuff that you do early on. You know, I was single for most of that. But we opened a bar a year before we had a baby. And that was the first step where I kind of realized, hey, you've got some responsibility mm-hmm. that, that requires you to not just be able to, to fuck off all the time. Can't be at the bar every night. Um, right. And that dialed it back a bit. And then when I took on the club, that that was, I mean, a lot. I mean, 70-hour weeks, you know, the first couple of years, a lot of that. Um, you know, I would I would say that Sarah did a lot of the heavy lifting with our first kid. Mm. And Sarah has her own, my wife, Sarah, has her own career. She's She runs a marketing company and, and is just a badass at what she does too. Uh, but when we kind of got into our, our second daughter was born a month before the pandemic, um, in a snowstorm. <laughs> and we should have recognized at that point that she was a hellraiser, but, um, but <laughs> she's you know, adorable though. since Margo was born and the pandemic was, this is one of the main takeaways I got from COVID. It taught me to slow down a little bit and realize what was important. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I think that for me, it, it was harder to figure that out because I'm such a workaholic, but, you know, we just got back from Florida a week ago and I, it was the first family vacation. All four of us had gone on like a big vacation and I didn't check my email the entire week. I hung out with the girls on the beach and, you know, when I got back, I was talking to Derek and I was like, you know, we need a GM. I'm, I'm just, I'm kind of, you know, I don't do that anymore. And I gave him the job and You know, so for me, I've evolved into making more, like, I don't ever really want to miss Abby's, you know, cheer competitions Mm. anymore, or, you know, Margo dumping Legos on her head. My two-year-old is just a (laughs) hell on wheels, like an insane person. Um, and, and it's funny because you see in them qualities that you had when you were younger, um, and that may, that softens you up, makes you a little younger again. And for me, I can get my job done in 40, 50 hours a week. But if there's something that's more important for family, I kind of try to prioritize that now. Mm. And that's really, you know, it's one of those things that I wouldn't have said that 10 years ago because I wouldn't want my boss to hear about it. Or, and, and when I say boss, I report to a board. Um, but I wouldn't want people to know that about me because the image we portray is that we live and die in this. But I think coming out of COVID, the rest, the restaurant industry as a whole has decided, you know what? Family's more important than anything. Cause we actually got to spend time with them. I think it's outside of just the restaurant industry though. Well, sure. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm just giving you my experience. No, a hundred percent. But I, I actually, but the, I feel that too. The, it's the a, yeah. first time I got COVID, um, was surprising cause it was two days before Thanksgiving. We mm. were doing our first big event since we'd shut down and I had to call my staff and I was like, I have COVID. I can't come in and I can't be there. And they were going to do the sun's irresponsible now, but around 500 people for Thanksgiving Mm. across 30,000 square feet. So, um, (laughs) but I basically, or, and we live in such an age, I ordered groceries that were delivered to the front door. Um, hasty baked a Turkey. Had a boy made like 18, all the sides because I had all day. (laughs) And actually was at home for Thanksgiving for the first time in 15 years. And it was delightful. <laughs> and I don't ever want to not do it Beside again. for being sick. Yeah, yeah. No, Aside I just, from I, that. I, you know, yeah. you think about all this stuff and, and like, yeah, I don't work the fourth. I don't work Father's Day. I try not to work Mother's Day now because it's really for my wife. 
but yeah, for me, like I've, I've, I think I've done a lot of the great things that I wanted to do in my career. I'm not finished, but you know, we all have to still make a living and do that stuff. But I think that you can do that and, and you raise your kids to, to be better than you. And that's, mm. that's what my focus is now. So, um, I, uh, you know, my, my kids love coming up to the club with me, like just on Saturday, if I go up to do some paperwork, it's almost kind of like the book Eloise. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but yeah. the little girl that lives in the Plaza hotel in New York city, they get to run around this like really immaculate, cool club and like, you know, push chairs around and, and, you know, it, their imagination runs wild. Um, that's gotta be cool. Like it's for be, them. Yeah. And, and, you know, my oldest is my little running buddy. She likes to go out to fancy dinners with me. In fact, her favorite restaurant is Bull in the Alley and I need to <laughs> bring her in, Katie. Um, but, uh, I love that. but yeah, we, uh, you know, you just, it, it's too important because I don't know how else to tell them don't do what I did. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, which is, you know, this, this career. Yeah. I'm um, really, I'm really curious to see where where the work life balance is for society over the next decade. You know, I'm, I'm really curious because I think the majority of people learned a very similar lesson to the one that you just explained. And I don't have like, I mean, I have a family and like a mother and brother yeah. and all that stuff, but you know, I'm not married. I don't have kids. I just have my two dogs. Yeah. But John, but you've like, got, you got, you know, the restaurant business as a whole is like a family. Very true. You yeah. are linked in with a lot of us and I appreciate you know, that. No, I mean, it, it's, I mean, before I had a family, I had a family, right. you know, um, you I know, meant more from like a, I knew what you meant about like, well, I'll tell you, I'll being tell you home what, with your kids, what you I know? really want to yeah. get to in the next five years, this is a goal for me. I am going to try at least within my organization to normalize the four day work week. It may Ooh, be, it okay. may be 10 hours. You may work a split or a right. double, but you're off three days in a row. So the mental health problem that we've experienced in the service industry has been astounding. Um, you know, drug abuse, alcoholism, all the fun things that go along with, you know, working in a restaurant, but COVID really made it worse. And I've got people that coming out of it, you know, you know, you, you, we were literally having to go in and serve people who didn't give a shit about COVID regulations. And we were the ones at risk because we were going to work. Yep. Um, and not to get that, that's not a political statement. It's just a health statement. I mean, we we had to make a living and we had to expose ourselves potentially to getting infected to, to keep our jobs. Um, but what I've realized is that having consecutive time off days is good. And we're, we're going to start with an experiment on our management staff to where they're working basically a nine or 10 hour day, mm. which they already do anyway but do it four days a week to where they're getting a 40 hour week instead of 50 hour week. And that's costly. You have to hire extra management to do mm -hmm. that. But what people don't understand is that if you, you have that, you have a larger team, which makes you stronger. And if, if you educate well, but I'd really be interested to see what it does at the cook and server level. Um, if they can make, because in our business, we pay a living hourly wage and tips are optional, which mm. not every place gets to do that. It's been a successful and or failed experiment, depending on who you are. Uh, but I think that for us, you know, that's the next thing I want to see if it'll, it'll work and sure it costs more to have more staff, but we have to remember what we're doing. Mm. And I, I preach this at work all the time. I go to a really fancy place every day and we serve people food and drinks. That is what I do for a living. It's a good gig. Um, it's not anything more than that now. And people could argue that it is, but we walk in and we're informed people about what we do and we try to do the best that we can do. But it, we're just like, when I get somebody who's really upset about an overdone steak, yeah. I don't really engage in argument with them. I'm just like, Hey, we're just doing food and drinks here. Let me get it for you. Let me, I'll take care of that. But Let's not have Just the breathe, vein pop breathe, out of your buddy. head yeah. because, you know, your steak got cooked a little too long or too short. Yeah. So, um, so that's my next thing is trying to, I, I think that you're going to see to your point that people want to work at home more or can work at home more. Um, some people do and some people don't like that, but I think that overall 
my hope is that America adopts a more European thought process towards, at least I have, towards holiday or vacation. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm off for the next five days. I had five days of PTO that were going to die after the fourth if I didn't take them. Didn't get paid for them, didn't get to take them. Why haven't I taken the time off? Right. Why am I not doing that? And there have been years that have gone by where I haven't had a day off vacation, period, even though I had PTO days. Right. So making it mandatory to not be there, which sounds completely counterintuitive to working, may be the answer to me. It might be. So, and you know, I mean, uh, and that's just like natural wine. Maybe I'm just blowing the whole thing up and being an <laughs> idiot. But um, for me, you know, that is paying homage to the way we used to do things, but also trying to make it better. Yeah. The way we structured our vacation here. Um, I mean, we're two years old, so still room to grow, but we just have unlimited vacation. As long as it doesn't, you have to request it off. Even our employees, you have to request it off. It can't conflict with other productions or other things that you might be needed for, but you Are you hiring? Days. Yeah, sure. Come on. <laughs> as many days as you want off. Like it's one of those things where if we hire you, that means we trust you to get your shit done. Yeah. And so, well, and, and you, you work feel with like, a lot of people you probably trust through. And, and that's yeah. the same goes for me. I mean, yeah. you know, some of my staff I've worked with for the better part of 20 years, like we've gone from mm -hmm. place to place together and, you know, I'm about to go see a bunch of them here in a minute where I started, uh, and that's going to be interesting, but no, yeah. it's a, uh, I'm, I'm optimistic that we will get yeah, I am too. to a better place, uh, on all this stuff. And that maybe, you know, wine can be kind of natural, but not completely yeah. natural. The so. other side of that sword, just to make sure you guys don't think we're pushovers here is if you don't get your shit done and you're taking days off, then you're probably not yeah. going to have a job here. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's, it puts the responsibility on have a workaholic, well, work smarter, not harder. Exactly. You know, get it done. That is one of my mottos that, and uh, it's better to ask forgiveness than permission. Always, yeah, always those two things. All right, let's end with this. How did a guy from Tulsa, Oklahoma become a fan of a premier league soccer team? Interestingly enough, uh, two, two, two ways. When I, where I grew up in Muskogee, um, we didn't have cable cause I lived out in a rural area. But we had one of those gigantic satellite dishes. Mm -hmm. And so you could watch things from around the globe or you could watch like your favorite show, be it G.I. Joe, Transformers. And I'm talking when I was five <laughs> in five episode blocks. Still right now you're watching Transformers Because that's how it was night. stored on the satellites. Oh, okay. And, but I got into Premier League soccer watching and, and really La Liga a lot too mm. when I was a kid. Um, and I had some friends that played club ball in Tulsa. But then when I moved here... Uh, Trey and my friend Mike Stack had both become Chelsea fans. And I, you know, I was familiar with Chelsea watching them in the 90s when they were doing like their FA Cup run and stuff like that. And I was like, yeah, I know who they are. Let's do this. And I had some friends that were fans of other teams that aren't very good. And, um, you know, what I realized in kind of really, because I, I really got into it when that was back probably 2009, 10, somewhere in there. Um, there's no commercials. Mm -hmm. It's two hours, which, you know, I love baseball and I love American football, but I don't have four hours to commit to a baseball game on television. Very true. If I'm going to do it, I'd rather just go to a ballpark and watch a game. Absolutely. Um, Much better experience. And, you know, secondarily, uh, and now that Harry Carey's dead, no one cares. <laughs> um, but secondarily, uh, it, it's really the uninterrupted nature of it, mm. you know, I, I still, I mean, I can devote six hours to football on Sunday. Don't tell my wife that, but if I really want to, I can watch the noon and the three o'clock game. Sure. But you know, for me, it's just a little bit more of a complete sport. Um, mm. there's a little less, I mean, the rules are pretty simple. Um, but it's also it reminds, me, it reminds me of the American coach in Paris, Ted Lasso yeah. video prior to Ted Lasso, the yes. show. <laughs> it's like, just like all the rules he didn't know. Like, oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, and, and my wife, him. my wife played soccer. Uh, yeah. and I remember when I started getting into it with Trey and Mike and, and really, and she's like, can you explain the offsides rule to me? And I could, mm -hmm. you know, cause you know, I'm not going to not be informed about a sport that I want to watch. Uh, and she didn't like that, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, it's that, that's how I got in premier league soccer. And quite frankly, the other really great thing about it living in the U S is that I can get up and watch the match at it's six early. or nine yeah. 
and I'm done by 11 and then I can still go to Lowe's and maybe the Olive Garden if there's enough time. Um, I just don't know. I just don't know. Um, but, uh, yeah, like I, and I get up early anyway, like I'm, I don't sleep a lot. So for me in the mornings, yeah. it's a peaceful time to watch premier league sports. Uh, you really shouldn't drink beer that early in the morning, oh, but we do, we do sometimes, yeah. but, uh, but also, you know, it's just when it's done, it's done. And then the last day of the season is like, just that was madness. fun. It's madness. Yeah, that was fun. It's just madness. So. I just haven't, maybe my fandom is, I don't know. I, I don't know, but you went I through an arrested development because you got into it during COVID a little bit. I mean, I've always been, I played soccer as a kid, but like I didn't have, it's hard for me to be a fan of a team without, like, I can't just choose a team to be a fan of. For, you, you liked know, him because Pulisic was playing for him, didn't you? I did. Okay. So I've, what I've become for soccer outside of like rooting for the USA and the world cup and all that stuff is I'm a fan of players. Yeah. I, I've become that because for me, like I'm a fan of the Dallas teams because I grew up there. I'm a fan of the Thunder because I covered them forever. I'm a fan of TU and OU. I went to OU, TU. I know the whole staff when it comes to football. But, like, you know, I can't just pick, like, I'm not just going to be a fan of Rutgers football. Who's your baseball team? For, eh, I mean, Texas Rangers because I grew up in Dallas. That's fair enough. Yeah. And quite frankly, we all have to admit that Nolan Ryan was I mean, I was at that game. I was you? at the Robin when Ventura game. Him. I was sitting in the so outfield with my dad. Every day, that, yeah. every year when that day comes up and I don't recall the date off the top of my head, but I have to pull that. I think it was that June vi- something. I have to pull that video up Maybe because July. it may be the most astounding oh. beat down anyone ever got on live TV. I, I mean, mean the amount that, of that's res- saying a lot because I saw yeah. Tyson fight. But yeah. The amount of respect he garnered from that one. Oh yeah. I mean, it still is there today. I would still be afraid of him if I ran into 100%. him on the street. I mean, Nolan Ryan's a badass. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. I, I mean, you and I have basically all the same, same. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. But it's I, just, I like I like the Rangers. I mean, yeah. You know. It's just hard for me. Like I, I watch Premier League in the mornings. You know, Josh Royal's a huge Liverpool fan, so I keep up with them. You guys are big with Chelsea. I keep up with them. I have a buddy that's a fan of Man United, so I score watch for who? them. Uh, he's in Oklahoma City. No, who? The team? Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, like, you know, Man City is the, the Yankees of the Premier League. Basically, yeah. they just buy their way to championships. But you know, I can't. I don't know. It feels artificial to me to just pick a team without a reason. Well, I, think, you know, I haven't I lived the, there. I, and that's not t- talking shit on anyone that's fans. No, of, you're, yeah. Yeah, I think people are drawn to sports for different reasons. Mm-hmm. And you have a pretty interesting lens through which you get to look at it because you were a sports analyst for so long. Um, right. I think that maybe that's why I well, lean and, towards players. Well, and I think that maybe you watch it with a bit more of a critical eye than we do. You mm-hmm. can separate emotion from it. I'm a horrible fan. Oh, I, I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan, and yeah. I hate watching them because I just yell at the TV. I mean, like for the last I, 25 right. years, yeah. I've been yelling at the Dallas Cowboys. I still do this if I go to a game, or if I'm watching a game. It's more in person, but even on TV, like I don't cheer very often because I, for a decade of my life, we weren't supposed to cheer because we were press, and right. that was not allowed. But mainly, I still do this, and I can't. I haven't been able to break it yet. I'm watching a game from an analytical standpoint to know what I would want to talk about later, even though later I'm not talking about anything. Yeah. So like I'm in it in like a way that like, I'm not just there enjoying the atmosphere or the time. I mean, I do enjoy it, but right. it's, it's still different. I still haven't broken well, through. It's very much. So when you go to a sporting event, it's like when I go out to eat, mm. I'm analyzing everything constantly all the time, yeah, which very, is why I like to similar. cook at home as opposed to going out. Yeah. I can't watch local news either. Oh, I'm sure. I mean, you can't came over it. to my house for a barbecue one time. Yeah. I can't eat barbecue anywhere because mine's just better. But, um, <laughs> you know, and when, I, get, when, when yeah. I go to a restaurant, I I literally, my wife hates it. We usually have to go places that, it, and it's really hard downtown at least, where people don't recognize you or have worked with you. Mm-hmm. Because we're actually trying to go out and have dinner together. And if I go out to Lowood or Bull, Not like talk everybody, shop all night, everybody yeah. knows me. Right. And, no big deal. That sucks. It's just Jerry Jordan. No, it just, it, it, no, know, I don't, me, like, I, know. I don't get the same experience that everybody else does. So I don't view it the same way. And I think your sports experience is a lot the same because yeah. I'm analytical about everything that I do. And I, and I would never analyze somebody within the restaurant in real time. But, you know, if I see something, 
I almost take it and go, do we do that? Should we improve our mm. process on that? I mean, it's, you know, you're not in the moment you're thinking. No. And, yeah. and my wife probably hates hearing that, but, um, which is why when we go out of town, we always have fantastic dinners. Cause I don't know anybody. That's the I, best way to do it. I have it. No, yeah. no expectations, but yeah. well, I appreciate you doing this. Hey man, this was, was a lot, a lot of, fun. of fun. Yeah. Cheers. Enjoy, enjoy chalkboard. I will. And enjoy yeah. that swick national national almost said national one oh, no, that's my it's gift. not the national that's my gift your stuff oh, okay yeah <laughs> i won't tell them they might love it i don't know i'm not going to tell them we, should, we yeah just let's go taste, taste test them let's taste test them all right let's all do right. it we'll be right back thanks sean thanks to jared jordan from coming in um i learned more in that podcast than i have in any other podcast that we've done his knowledge of wine i mean i hope it came through it it was astounding and i love the soapbox that we went on about natural wines it I had to stifle a laugh a couple of times, uh, but that was just, that was a lot of fun for me. I hope it was fun for you to listen and watch as well. Next episode, Justin Thompson, right here in this chair next to me. Uh, I can't wait to talk to him about his new concept that he's opening here in just a few days. It's called Freya Nordic cuisine right here in the middle of the country in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I have so many questions. Can't wait to tackle all of them with him. That will be on the next episode of the tasting room. I'll see you then.